It's Friday, Friday. Gotta get down on Friday. Everyone's looking forward to the weekend and I'm looking forward to this brand new series. That's right, it's time for a brand new series here on Cultaholic. And basically to explain it, I'm gonna use Eddie Guerrero as an example. When I was a kid, everyone was talking about how Eddie Guerrero was amazing and brilliant and he was cited as one of the greatest. And I never really got that. I was watching his matches and I didn't really understand because I was a small child. But as I got older and as I went back and watched some of his earlier matches and feuds and promos, it clicked. Uh, and nowadays, Eddie Guerrero is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. So that's where the idea for this series comes in. I thought that I could take a different wrestler each week, one who is regarded as a bit of an all-time great, and really break down what makes them such an incredible wrestler. And we're starting off with a man many consider to be one of the greatest of all time, Daniel Bryan. So in a little bit, what we're gonna do is break Daniel Bryan's greatness down into five key categories that I feel make him one of the greatest of all time. But before we do that, I think it's fair to say that Bryan's career can generally, broadly, be split into two distinct categories. And the first half of his career is really one that newer or younger fans may be unfamiliar with. They may look at him as a member of the WWE roster and say, yes, he's a great wrestler, but what is it that makes him so highly regarded? What is it that separates him from all the other great wrestlers on the roster. Well, in the 2000s, Brian was like the indie legend of the United States. Because for so long, the idea of an all-time great was very much a foreign concept. Usually in Japan, people like Mizawa and Kabashi, but suddenly emerging in the 2000s, primarily in Ring of Honor, the States had this wrestler that was their version of like the ultimate work rate legend. And then after he'd proven all that he could prove on the independent scene, he obviously signed with WWE as we approached the 2010s. And this is where a lot of doubters said, well, yes, Brian is an all time great on the indies, but can he really replicate that in WWE with bigger opponents? He's suddenly gonna seem so small and with a style that maybe doesn't really mesh with his. And as we now know, he proved that he could beyond a shadow of a doubt. So Brian has proved to everybody that not only is he an elite level indie worker, but also a main event mainstream WWE superstar at the same time, which is incredible. And now we're gonna to get to the first of our categories. Because when you look at Daniel Bryan today in the ring, if you're unfamiliar with his past, you might think, well, he's good at everything. So what makes him great is quite hard to pin down. He's good at striking, he's good at wrestling, he's, he, he takes to the skies occasionally, he does the occasional dive, and he pretty much excels whatever he chooses to do. But underpinning all of that is the first of our categories, and for me, that is his technical ability. Daniel Bryan, for much of his career, was regarded as the best technical wrestler in the world. So much so that he won the Wrestling Observer's Best Technical Wrestler Award every single year from 2005 until 2013. That's pretty, I mean, it's pretty good, you could say. So now we're gonna take a closer look at the first of our matches, which is often regarded by many as one of Daniel Bryan's best matches ever. His showdown with Kenta at Ring of Honor's Glory by Honor 5, Night 2. So indie. And if you're only gonna watch one match to understand why Daniel Bryan is so revered on the indie scene, this one might well be it. Even the closing sequence alone, he's doing suplexes with crisp perfection, even towards the end of a very long match. He's throwing strikes as hard as ever. He's countering everything that Kenta can throw at him, but he's also taking his fair share of punishment too. And watching this, you can just tell that his technical level is pretty much unparalleled. Although Kenta does come pretty close. All of his movements are so crisp and so clean. There's no real wasted motion, but at the same time, he's got the showmanship and the ostentatiousness that a pro wrestler needs to show the crowd that, you know, this is a performance, but we're gonna make it look as good as possible. But his technical mastery doesn't just extend to what he's like on the offensive side of things. When he's taking punishment, Brian's mind is still alert and he's still got a very strong grasp of what he technically needs to do on the defensive. When wrestlers work a body part, they often pick the left-hand side because most people are right-hand dominant and it means that when they make their comeback, they don't need to worry about selling the side that's already injured. Kenta and Brian, or Brian Danielson, I guess, as he was then known, decide, no, we're too good for that and we're gonna work Brian's right-hand side instead. Is that all right with you, mate? And Daniel presumably was like, yes, I am an excellent wrestler, shut up. So Ken has been working Danielson's right arm for a lot of this match and there comes a moment, a strike exchange that I just wanna focus on for a second. 
where basically Brian realizes that his right arm is pretty much useless by this point and starts exchanging with his left. It doesn't look as natural, but that's the point. You know, it's his non-dominant side and he still puts a lot of fizz on those strikes. And just that moment for me really helps sum up what makes Brian or, or Brian Danielson so great. He knows he's got a good understanding of what makes an in-ring situation feel like real combat and he uses that to make the match all the more believable. It's just really quite something. But then when we take Brian out of a situation in Ring of Honor in the mid-2000s, which is like the ultimate indie haven, where the action's supposed to be a bit more realistic, I suppose, and we put him in the sports entertainment world of WWE, we see that he's still got all of that technical ability. Remember, for example, his match with Drew Gulak at last year's Elimination Chamber. And as we can see from some of the holds and exchanges and counters and all the mat wrestling in this match, even though they're in a bigger ring with a lot more space to work with, even though they're in front of perhaps an audience less familiar on the whole with the technical aspects of wrestling that make it all the more real, they still do it and they do it so well. They slow the pace down. This isn't like Brian's match with Kenta where they're furiously exchanging every counter they can think of. This is more deliberate, more ponderous, and that translates so well to a modern WWE audience. But now it's time to move on to point two because you can be the smoothest technical wrestler in the world. It doesn't necessarily mean your matches are gonna be that exciting. You need a certain sting. You need a certain aggression about things. And funnily enough, that is point two, Daniel Bryan's incredible aggression. So the first thing I wanna look at in relation to Daniel Bryan's aggression is his feud in Ring of Honor with Nigel McGuinness. For those of you who might not know, Nigel McGuinness, before he talked on WWE, he was an absolute badass. And his feud with Daniel Bryan in the mid 2000s was absolutely incredible. I recommend checking out all their big set piece matches in that feud, but we're gonna focus on one in particular where basically Bryan put up his Ring of Honor World Championship in a unification match against Nigel McGuinness, who was the pure champion, which meant that this match was kind of billed as a bit of a technical classic and instead, we got one of the most brutal matches of either man's career. And part of the reason is because Brian, who was a heel at this point, during his Ring of Honor World title run, he was a bit cocky, he wasn't afraid of bending the rules, he was merciless towards his opponents. Fans didn't really like him. They respected him a lot because he was brilliant, but they didn't like him. And this match was in hostile territory for Brian. This match took place in Liverpool, in Nigel McGuinness's home country of England, in front of a rabid crowd of drunk Englishmen. Um, and basically, you might expect Daniel Bryan to come into this match Fighting like a bit of a caged animal, cagey, maybe looking for a counter here and there, hitting things out of desperation. And instead, he decided, no, I'm, I'm Daniel Bryan, I'm the heel champion of Ring of Honor. I'm going to fight you like a final boss. I don't care if you're bigger, I don't care if you're more beloved. I'm going to try and dominate. It's a very tricky dynamic. Brian's the smaller of the two, comfortably, uh, and yet he has to try and dominate this match. And he does so with the help of one of the most controversial spots in the career of both men. The ring post spot, you might have heard about it, you might have seen it. They're on the outside, Brian links McGuinness's arms through the side of the ring post and just yanks him head first into the post and his head busts open. It's not a nice spot, you certainly wouldn't like to see it replicated today. Very unsafe, very risky, but man, was it effective. I mean, what can you say? And Brian ultimately did win the match after an absolute war between the two but one that really helped bring out his aggressive side. That for me is one of the signature spots of Daniel Bryan's career for good and bad reasons, but it's certainly not the only match that helps really demonstrate why his aggression is so key. So now we're going from a match where Bryan was the superior champion, even though his opponent was bigger, he still was probably the favorite, to a match where he absolutely was the underdog, his match with Takeshi Morishima. I mean, look at Morishima, he's a big boy. He's a big, big boy, a big beefy boy. And I was fortunate enough to interview Daniel Bryan once on the phone and asked him who's the person who's hit him the hardest in his entire career. And he said it was Morishima. I mean, he fractured his orbital bow. It was pretty brutal. And this match, I think, is comparable to the match between Volta and Ilya Dragunov we saw in NXT UK last year, where both men are very different in terms of stature, but are equal in terms of aggression and punishment. Bryan brings the aggression in this match more than in perhaps any other match I've ever seen him do it in, with perhaps the exception of the McGuinness one. And he does so in short little bursts. Morishima's smothering him, he's dominating the match. Brian's no longer the champion. This came a bit later on in his career. He was trying to get the belt back. Uh, and Morishima 
dominates large portions, but then at certain moments, this aggression comes forth and Brian springs back to life. Moments like this one in particular, where he just bursts out of nowhere with a German suplex to a far bigger man. He's hitting strikes, he's hitting elbows, he grabs, he does a bit of a signature Daniel Bryan spot, or maybe Bryan Danielson when he was more ruthless back in the day, but he's brought it back in WWE, grabbing his opponent's arms and stomping down on his head again and again and again and again and some more times as well for emphasis. And ultimately, Brian lost this one. He didn't recapture the Ring of Honor World Championship, but his aggression and his desire made it a thrilling contest. And hopefully through those two matches, I've helped demonstrate how Brian's aggression can help carry him through to the next level, whether he's a heel or a babyface. But wrestling, as weird as it sounds, isn't always about wrestling, is it? It's about everything. It's not just about work rate in the ring. It's about how you connect with the crowd. It's not just about how crisp your moves are. It's about how you make the audience feel when they're watching your matches. So that's where we get to point number three, his connection with the crowd. Now, for a long time, Brian was regarded as an amazing worker, of course, but compared to some other contemporaries, such as, for example, CM Punk, his persona wasn't seen as a particular strength. Yes, he'd connected with the crowd in these matches we've already talked about on the independent scene, because they're indie fans who love good wrestling, and he's good at the good wrestling, if you see what I mean. But then coming to WWE, of course, he'd have to do that all over again, build his reputation in front of an audience where a lot of them wouldn't be as familiar with him. And this is where we look at how Brian forged an incredibly strong connection with the crowd, as we all now know. Because of WWE's slower, more deliberate, more obvious, I guess, style, Brian had to adapt. And I think what he did here was trade in some of that technical intricacy for a sense of momentum an incredible sense of momentum, better than maybe any wrestler we've ever seen. And the most obvious place to look for examples of this momentum is, is Brian's amazing ability in the comeback, the classic comeback section of the match when he's working from underneath. Uh, and I think to look at that more obviously, we need to look at what is regarded by many as his best WWE match, SummerSlam 2013 against John Cena. And the closing section of this match is a perfect example of how Brian builds this momentum. It gets the crowd up, he, he lowers the crowd down, he gets the crowd up again, and then explodes into the finish. I mean, this all starts with just a strike exchange, and then Cena goes for the AA, and Brian reverses it into a big DDT, and the crowd will come up. Then things slow down, he heads up top, he waits for Cena to get up, he leaps off the top rope, gets caught, the crowd sort of think, oh no, what's wrong, they deflate a bit again. Cena goes for another AA, bang, reversal, near fall for a two count, the crowd are up again. And then just when we think we're going to see several more examples of this wave of rising and falling as both men battle it out, it gets cut short. And that's very exciting indeed, because out of nowhere, Brian, instead of, you know, going into another exchange with Cena, just kicks his head off, sets himself in the corner and blasts him with that now famous running knee. And because we were expecting this exchange maybe to go on a little bit longer, and then he just decided, no, I've got the momentum now, bang. That's what makes it so exciting. And the fact that Daniel Bryan won the WWE Championship, which a lot of us never thought would happen. And also I think the use of the knee as a finisher was really symbolic in this moment because it's all represented Bryan's change in style. And in fact, to sort of emphasize this, 2013, when this match took place, was the last year that Bryan ever won the Wrestling Observer Newsletter's Technical Wrestler of the Year Award. This is when he gave over his crown to Zack Sabre Jr. essentially, but it represented the wrestler he'd now become. Another example of this expert use of momentum and manipulation of crowd emotion came in the opening match of WrestleMania 30, regarded by many as the greatest, or one of the greatest, WrestleMania opening matches of all time, alongside Bret versus Owen. Uh, and it was Triple H and Bryan, a much more traditional, dynamic, heel face, the crowd all behind one guy. And that was different to the Cena match, which was two baby faces throwing everything they had at each other. This one had a more slow, deliberate action and Brian still managed to get the crowd behind him in an almighty surge. And again, we get an example of this cut short closing sequence uh, in an even more extreme instance this time. Triple H goes for the pedigree, Brian backdrops him out into a near fall pinning, sort of bridging combination. Triple H gets out of that, maintains the pedigree position, and it looks bad for Brian, but he gets out of that as well. And we're expecting a bit more of a struggle. And then out of nowhere, Brian's flipping out of a back suplex attempt, nailing the running knee, and it's all over in seconds. Genius. So whether it's done in a bit of a balls to the wall encounter like the one against Cena or a bit more of a traditional dynamic like the one against Triple H at Mania 30, Brian knows how to build momentum with the crowd and he's got a mastery of it and a sense of timing and suddenness and then slowing down and then suddenness again, which I think few wrestlers really have mastered to that degree. Now we get on to section number four, because I mentioned that Brian's persona was often regarded as a weakness of his earlier on in his career, compared at least to his elite level in-ring ability. 
This is where we call section four, I think, finding his charisma. We haven't talked about Brian's mic work at all in this video so far. Um, and that's because he really came into his own quite late on in his career. He built it up throughout the 2010s in WWE with, with a few little heel runs here and there. The team with Kane, the fact that he was all bratty and stroppy when he didn't get his way. But he became a lot more sinister in just the past couple of years in that feud with Kofi Kingston. In fact, we need to rewind a little bit to the title run prior to the feud with Kofi Kingston. The eco-warrior thing with the, the eco-friendly belt and everything that went with it. Brian's mic work here was on another level. He was funny, he was witty, he was hilarious, but he was very hateable as well. In my opinion, it's the best promo work of his entire career. And like all good villains in any form of media, like the very best villains, he was kind of right. He had a point of view that you could sympathize with, but he took his methods to villainous extremes. And of course, becoming a better heel on the mic only makes you want to cheer his opponents more and hope that they beat him. And, and that, compounded with Brian's already excellent in-ring skills, makes for a pretty explosive feud, if you book it right. Enter Kofi Kingston. This very strong dynamic wasn't entirely backed up by both men's great work in the ring. It was backed up by their strong personas. Brian, the heel that everybody wanted to see lose. Kofi, the veteran who'd never really been given his time in the sun. And it led to some incredible moments. Think of the moment at Elimination Chamber when Kofi jumped on top of the pod, cornering Brian and standing over him. And everybody's thinking, yes, he's finally going to get his. Come on, Kofi, you can do it. And then Brian weaseled out with the victory. And then of course it all paid off at WrestleMania with Kofi grabbing Brian's arms like Brian had done to so many opponents in his past and stomping on his head again and again en route to an emotional, amazing victory. And I'm not trying to downplay Kofi's role here because he was absolutely incredible and he more than held up his end of the bargain. But I feel like Brian helped make the feud also be as amazing as it could be. The main story is Kofi getting the belt, but if he'd beaten Jinder Mahal, would it have been quite as, I feel really bad now, I've got nothing against Jinder. But if he'd beaten an opponent who perhaps fans weren't as dialed in with as a heel, then would it have been quite as thrilling? Arguably yes, but I'd suggest maybe just a little bit less so. And finally, we get to our fifth category, explaining why Daniel Bryan, in my mind, is one of the greatest of all time. And that's all down to a very simple thing, relatability. Now you might be saying, hold on Jack, isn't this the same as point three, his connection with the crowd? But there I was kind of focusing more on in-ring stuff, how he managed to draw the emotions out of the crowd during a wrestling match. In this instance, I just want to talk about how we perceive Daniel Bryan on the whole. If we're looking at the traditional stuff that makes a great wrestler, Daniel Bryan falls down clearly in one category. It's not his in-ring action, certainly not. It's not even his mic skills because they've grown amazingly over time. It's his look, isn't it? It's that old school thing. Oh, you need to look like a star when you walk through the airport. People need to turn their heads. Who's that guy? Daniel Bryan's not very tall. He's not particularly jacked. I mean, he, more than me, more than the average person, but not especially so, especially for a wrestler in North America, the land of the giants in wrestling. And yet, despite that, it works to his advantage. That's because Daniel Bryan, for two reasons, I think, is incredibly relatable. One, He's like you and me, uh, uh, he's not obviously, he's incredibly talented, more so than any of us will ever be in any category of our lives, but he seems like he's like you and me. He's the wrestler that smarky wrestling fans would be if they could. And it seems like a bit of an achievable goal. He's not got the natural attributes, but if we trained hard enough, maybe we too one day could be as good as Daniel Bryan. Of course, that's a lie. He is incredibly talented, but that's the perception that he gives off, a bit of an everyman. And also, he's just incredibly likeable, isn't he? Whenever you see an interview with Daniel Bryan outside of his character, he's such a nice guy and cares so much about wrestling. He's so passionate. And again, that relates him to us, the fans, because we are passionate about wrestling. And often there's certain wrestlers who don't seem too passionate about wrestling. It's just a job for them. Whereas with Daniel Bryan, it's an art form. In my interview with him, I asked Bryan what else he's got left to achieve. He's won everything, he's proven everything, he's done, he's done everything. And he said to me, that he's got this crazy goal that he knows is pretty much impossible of having the perfect wrestling match. It's like a, an unachievable art form that he wants to reach. And I thought that was such a charming and wonderful answer because he's not after the you know belts anymore. He's done everything there is to do in wrestling, but he wants to just do it for the art. He wants to have the perfect wrestling match. And it's this mentality and it's the fact that he's not seven foot tall and a Hollywood movie star that makes us love Brian even more. And I can't really think of any instance, any image that encapsulates that connection that we have with Brian more than the main event of WrestleMania 30, the aftermath, where he's holding up both belts, the confetti's streaming down, he's done it, he's defied the odds. 
and everyone unanimously was totally happy for Daniel Bryan. I've never seen a WrestleMania end on such an explosion of joy. And that was all down to the work he did, not just in the build up to that match, but over the course of his entire career. And it's for that reason, and for the five categories that I've talked about over the course of this video, that I think that Daniel Bryan is one of the greatest of all time. Like, without question. Uh, if you disagree, I I'm gonna have problems with you. But on a serious note, do let me know what you think in the comments section down below, not just about Daniel Bryan, but about the concept of this series as a whole going forwards. Let me know who you wanna see me analyze, that sort of thing. Let me know how we could improve this series as well in any aspect. I'm just all about the feedback. I really care about this video series. I'm really excited for it going forwards. So hopefully it all goes well. But yes, thank you very much for watching. I've been Jack from Cultaholic. Stay safe out there as well. Stay positive, and I'll see you very soon.